we are very very excited to have professor yoshua benjiu on money control uh, his only interview to any indian media professor yoshua benjiu from the university of montreal canada uh, is widely renowned as one of the godfathers of ai along with jeffrey hinton and yan lekun uh, he won the turing prize he's widely acclaimed for his work in machine learning and artificial intelligence professor benjiu an absolute pleasure to have you with us right here on money control uh, let Let me begin with you know something that I read this morning. Um, a publication reported that OpenAI is ready with uh, AI super agents that could do PhD level com complex work, and this is coming a few days after Mark Zuckerberg said in an interview that Meta may not need AI uh, human engineers anymore. They will make do with AI engineers. do you feel that you know all this is progressing a little too fast when we haven't created backstops for what we are going to do when human beings are going to be displaced by ai indeed there is a lot that we don't understand about these systems in particular we don't know how we can control them so they behave according to the norms and instructions that we give them um we haven't also planned um how to handle potential uh major uh labor market disruptions if these things happen in the coming years uh these transitions take time and are uh global and national uh social safety nets uh, are not going to be sufficient right um you know what's your take overall on the progress we've seen in ai in the last year and you know we are possibly going to see more and more happening um in the year ahead so the two main uh current weaknesses of large language models are in terms of reasoning and planning and also if you want uh bodily control like robotics and on the first two um we are seeing a lot of progress uh, especially reasoning with uh, for example open ai's uh, 01 and 03 that are breaking through benchmarks uh on abstract reasoning and things like this. So those who think that the scaling the the progress is stopped I think uh, could be wrong at least we continue to see so advances. The scaling laws haven't been re, uh, well haven't hit a wall. They they have been changed because now uh we have these methods of increasing computational resources at runtime rather than making just the neural network larger and train it longer. right um you know how can we prepare for a post ai world i was asking andrew ing this morning what would your advice be to an 18 year old today what would your advice be to someone who's worried about losing their jobs to ai and he said you know we should all learn to code to train our computers better to uh, you know master ai what's your take uh I mean it it may be that programming could be one of the first uh jobs that are going to be replaced by machines so uh we still need programmers to program the AI <laughs> but there might be less demand on the other hand i think that understanding like the science behind AI and especially AI safety how we make them safer how we can put guardrails around their behavior there are lots of open questions that need urgent answers before we get to AGI and human level or beyond. So I would encourage anybody who cares about our future, who wants to make sure, you know, their children or grandchildren will have a future to uh put their mind and um their good heart into finding solutions to these problems in science as well as in policy. How can we do this? I mean, who needs to take the mantle of AI safety should it come from the industry should it come from the government you know do we need a consensus globally on how to handle this well it doesn't look like we're going to have a consensus anytime soon mm -hmm. but the precautionary principle says you know if we're not sure if it's going to be catastrophic or it's going to be fine we better be cautious so who's got to do that work well the problem with uh the for profit corporations is that they are in a commercial race and that race is really around capabilities mm -hmm. uh how good is the ai answer in questions and not so much on safety which is protecting the public so yes they should do it but the government has a responsibility to put the right incentives for them for example if the government asks the companies to 
show a strong safety case before they can deploy something or they can train something. That will you know, incentivize them very strongly to do a lot more research on safety. Right. Um, you know, you and Jeffrey Hinton are on the more uh, pessimistic side of, you know, the, the, the a revolution we're seeing around AI. Uh, Jan Likun is more on the optimistic side. Um, I mean, wh on balance, where do you think this will end? Actually, I'm not pessimistic. It's just that I don't know. I'm agnostic. You're agnostic. I don't know how it's going to turn out. It could turn mm -hmm. out well. Uh, maybe we find solutions in time. Uh, or maybe we don't. Mm -hmm. And it is that uncertainty that I think we need to rationally take into account. Uh, and that should lead us to uh, working on the risk management, on the safety, uh, on finding technical solutions, as well as policy solutions to make sure people don't do stupid things with very powerful systems. Right. Uh, Professor Benji, back in India, there's this whole debate. Should India, you know, work on foundational models? Uh, should Indian companies focus on LLMs? Or should we instead take LLMs being developed by the West and focus on applications instead? What is your own take? What should the right path be for a country like India? Well, the countries that will have their own AI systems um, likely to have a geopolitical advantage in the future. Mm. So uh, we're seeing more and more countries willing, more and more governments willing to invest uh, in their own autonomous development. That being said, um, the proliferation of very powerful AI systems in the future, which can be used as weapons, is also kind of dangerous uh, in a way similar to nuclear weapons. So I think governments which decide to build their own uh, uh, systems uh, also need to work on international treaties to make sure we don't do stupid things. Right. Uh, Professor Benji, you know, today is also the day when Trump returns to the White House. What will that mean for the future of AI for the future of US Canada? <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. I, I don't think anybody does. Um, it's very hard to predict. Right. But are you positive from a tech perspective? Because some people believe that, you know, Silicon Valley is optimistic about Trump's return. They felt Biden was a little adversarial towards US tech. Would you agree with that? I don't know. Great. Um, finally, uh, Professor Benjou, if there are one or two predictions that you have from an AI lens for 2025, 2026, what would they be? I don't do predictions, but one thing I can say is that uh, there's a lot of noise uh, with companies saying they, they want to solve agency, like to build systems that are more autonomous. Agentic. Agentic systems, exactly. And, you know, there's a lot of good commercial reasons because that will allow to replace people in their jobs, and that's worth a lot of money. But people should also realize that's taking a lot of risks because it is autonomy that allows an AI to have its own goals, its own even self-preservation goals that could potentially be dangerous to us. Right. And any go-to AI apps that you have, how do you use AI in your life every day? I do use uh, some of the you know, main systems. Uh, they're very useful, especially when I'm asking questions outside of my area of expertise because they know so much stuff and so many languages. Are you worried about them hallucinating or giving you in incorrect information? Absolutely. So <laughs> you always have to check it for yourself. Great. On that note, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you.